um, in our uh, continuing series of presenters, um, our guest this evening had been with us once before. It was very popular. And a number of you had asked if he could come back. And I said, sure, I'll ask him. Um, I've known Bob for, well, most of my life. Um, when I was a kid, when I first got uh, licensed, I was living in Southern Illinois, uh, just you know, 20, 20 minutes south of the club that uh, he, he was president of. So it's, uh, it's been a long time. I've got, I've got miscellaneous Heil stuff. I've got this, which is a, a input module from one of his early audio mixers, one of the first modular mixers that was designed to be taken on the road. Um, and I'm, you know, wearing the appropriate shirt for this evening. So uh, without further ado, I will ask everybody to mute themselves, except for Bob. And I will then spotlight you, Bob, and turn it over to Mr. Bob, excuse me, Dr. Bob Heil, K9EID. Take it away, Bob. Oh, well, hello. Thanks for uh, having me again, Paul. It's, uh, it's always fun. I, I see, I think this is number 239 or 240 since uh, February 2020. I love sharing this hobby and, I, and sharing the science of it. And uh, kind of makes me sad when, like, Judy was, Julie was mentioning that she's been a ham all this year, all these years. And need to help her what you, you, there's so much fun here and it, it it all starts of course with the clubs i believe <clears throat> before i get into mine little uh session tonight i want to bring something to you that i think all of you are going to really enjoy it takes me about five minutes that club that paul was referring to was the Marissa Amateur Radio Club. I formed that, I'd been off the air for 12 years. <clears throat> and when I came back, uh, I was a technician for 17 years. Then I was off for 12. And then when I got off the road and all that, I came back to Marissa and I wanted to get back into the radio game. And I got an extra license and we started this club. This club was amazing. Marissa had a population of 2,000 people. There were 320 members in this club. And the reason is that we never held our meetings in the same place. They could have been McDonnell Douglas Aircraft. They could have been Wicks Pipe Organ. All of the different places. They, some of it didn't have anything to do with ham radio, but they were interesting. And they were in different locations because the repeater had four receivers and had about 120 mile coverage. And so it really worked out well. The thing that really started the big move in that club was I, uh, I got contacted by, uh, he was a salesman for Uniden and for high gain. He was selling me capacitors that we were building our amplifiers from. And he said, are you a ham? And I said, yes, sir. He said, they're going to throw a bunch of CB radios away at uh, a famous bar. That was a big deal in St. Louis. And, and uh, he said that they can't sell them because they're 23 channel. But he said they could give them to your club. So I go to Famous Bar and I came home with, I think there were 83 or 84 of them. Uh, yes, they were on the Citizens Band. But here's what happened. Every one that night got one of them. You'll see there's a young, young yad there holding the uh, microphone. That's a Paul Braun at about, I don't know, were we a 15, 14? Yeah, 16, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I, was, still ha I still have that radio, Bob. Yeah, well, they were fun. I uh, figured out how to take that, the, the radio, and then I bought several thousand of just the boards, and we figured out how to take a high gain board that I bought from high gain when they went bankrupt, bought all those boards, 
the little white in the lower left corner, that's a demodulator we made in the Ohio Sound plant because we had our own uh, printed circuit uh, manufacturing and so on. And uh, I had a chassis built. Uh, actually, Tentec did a lot of our chassis in those days, and they made the chassis. And I cannot tell you how many hundreds of people got involved with 10 meter FM. I still, when I go out to things today, I still have people that still have their, uh, as Paul, uh, they have their, uh, their FM 10. Uh, mine is uh, right, right there. <laughs> and when the, uh, when the bands start really to open and you can work uh, Japan and all over the world on 10 meter FM, get ready because it's really fun and uh, i even uh, wrote the book and it would tells you how to convert a cb radio to 10 meter fm and all kinds of other cool things about it but uh, uh here's another one i had this is uh, uh, another one uh, i put a speaker on the top of it marvelous stuff that's how ham radio should be today and we're, we're starting to see that crank up a little more but what I want to do tonight, I'm going to take a, just a couple of minutes because I was here before and, and you know my background from that, but for some of you that might not have been here, uh, at 12 year, at, I was 12 years old, my parents bought me a Hammond organ, that was a, a big deal, a B3 Hammond, uh, they weren't wealthy people, but they, uh, they thought I should have it because I'd been playing accordion. Across the street from it, was where I took my lessons was Walter Ash radio. And I'd go over there after while I'd be waiting on my mom or dad to pick me up. And uh, hmm, that was pretty cool. I was 12, but I got a job uh, up the line at Freeburg, Illinois, playing the organ at the age of 14, making quite a bit of money in the weekends. And um, it kind of guided me to wait a minute. <laughs> I don't need all of this stuff of history and all that because I was doing quite well. I had a special license at the age of 15 to drive my 1954 Plymouth convertible. And um, then I, in 56, that was a big year. Uh, I was uh, commissioned by Stan Can, who was the organist at the Fox in St. Louis to become the substitute. Now, why I tell you all of this, it's very interesting because that organ had not been played in 20 years and it needed to be voiced in tune. About 3,500 pipes from one inch to 32 foot. It's how little Bobby Heil learned to listen. Not a lot of people listen, they just hear. Listening, you have to dissect exactly what you're hearing, all of the harmonics, if there's any distortion underneath those harmonics, it really taught me a lot about listening. But in that same year, September, I got my license. It was a technician license. I went back to Walter Ash, bought a Harvey Wells, uh, SX-99 Helicrafters receiver, but that big box was a converter for six and two meters. You'll notice a little blue box on the left. I wish that picture would have been taken wider. That I had been a ham license for about four or five weeks. And I had, re, I had read an article in QST and I built a six meter transmitter using a 2E26. I was just fascinated with all of the building things that could be done. And I was off to the races. Not only that, but uh, I met a guy on the air, K0DGE. He was one of the very first on single sideband on six meters. This is 1956. It wasn't, sideband wasn't even really happening on the lower frequencies yet. He was the engineer at KMOX Radio in St. Louis. And um, it, it, I talked to him on the air. He was so thrilled because nobody had come back to him. I happened to hit the BFO button one night and there he was. He took me under his wing. He taught me so much. We built another six meter single sideband rig. We used a 20A, a 10B, I'm sorry. That's a central electronics. And we put, that was a kit and he guided me through that. 
Then I got a grid dip meter, a milling grid dip meter. It's because I had to wind coils and you need to know how to use one of those. I think everybody today should have one and, and realize what value it is. He gave me a laundry list to buy a bunch of parts, 6U8 and uh, chassis and all that. And that was a 36 megacycle oscillator. You take 14 out of the 10B, what do you got? Six meters. And I didn't realize really what I was in for because I was just building like crazy. You'll see that 10B on the left. Way over on the right, you see those little black boxes, the little dial on them. Those were the VFO because up in the, that time, man, you, you were crystal controlled. Well, I read an article how you could take a, a BC458 that was a transmitter on a B29 and make it into a VFO. That's exactly what I did. I had a wonderful uh, guy that was in in the uh, Motorola business just south of me, K9SGD. Paul knew him well. And also K9EBA, who was a contractor. They put up a 110-foot roan for me. I had these incredible, loving, wonderful parents allowed me to do anything. But there again, they didn't have to pay for it because I was doing quite well as a teenager with all my organ jobs and so on. But you'll notice that antenna. This is where it starts getting interesting tonight. All of the elements are not parallel with each other. They're not horizontal. They're not vertical. It was Telerex's spiral array. And what they were trying to do, and it worked, was cut down the fading. You see, when you, when you hear signals fade, right off the bat, you think, well, he just lost some power. No, when your signal leaves your antenna, it never stays in that plane. Before it gets to the receiving end, it might have changed three or four times from vertical to horizontal. Sometimes that's a 20 dB loss. The spiral array took care of some of that. And um, to kind of close this off, I built a six and two Thunderbolt. That uh, is just a wonderful piece. It was a kit. Give me a, a kilowatt and a half pair of 4CX250s on six and two meters. Larry guided me through that because he was saying, now look, 3,500 volts will kill you. Kill. Be careful. 1959, kilowatt on six meter sideband with uh, all these crazy antennas. And it was just unbelievable. Six meters was open all the time. And when I tell people that, they don't believe me, but it's true. It was the start of the biggest sunspot cycle. And it, uh, six meters was open uh, as much as anything else. They were, they were just wide open. And uh, this gave me a lot of, uh, of horsepower. You see the central electronics above me there. I built a Heath Kit Seneca. And I was just a building that. I got a call one day from Bob Drake of the Drake Company. He said, hey, you the guy that's got that single sideband kilowatt on six meters. And I said, I am. We checked with the AWRL, and you're just one of a few 10 on single sideband on six meters, much less a kilowatt and a half. We'd like for you to come to our meeting. We hold it once a year. It's an annual meeting. It's in the Biltmore Hotel. And we take all the furniture out of one of the floors, and we have people like uh, Bob Drake, Wes Shum, who is... He was the man that brought single sideband to ham radio. It wasn't Art Collins. It was Wes six years before uh, Collins got into sideband with the central electronics. I became very dear friends with him later in his life. Bill Halligan from Hallicrafter, Carl Mosley, all these wonderful people. They were celebrities to me because I was reading about them in the magazines. I would go, well, well, while I was there, I uh, met up with the J-Beam keep people and they said, hey, would you mind doing a test for us? We've got a, an antenna we'd like to ship over here. Uh, J-Beam was out of England. No problem. What they do, they sent me over 128 element array on two meters. This was, a, this was something, I'll tell you. My parents, again, we had a spare lot beside our house, so it, it fit quite well. And Joe Hall and K9EBA, 
Gus Bedina, Bedina put up a 40-foot roan with a 40-foot boom, a pair of prop pitch motors from a B-29 to turn and rotate them. And it was, it just, you know, we could be here for hours, but that's a pretty good synopsis of what really got me into ham radio. I had so many mentors and that's so important. And a lot of that comes today when, when you're, you know, you go to clubs and you meet people. It's, it's very interesting. But uh, later on in my life, uh, the bands around the, the area, the central uh, U.S., found out there was this guy with a soldering iron. Hmm. And I had, uh, I, I had got another job. I built a pipe organ uh, in the Wicks pipe organ plant uh, that uh, we put in this restaurant in the Holiday Inn. So that was a big deal. Uh, I had built a large PA from some speakers that the Fox Theater had tossed out, but I got tired of playing and I got more involved in the sound reinforcement world. My first concert was Jimi Hendrix. And um, <laughs> I got to tell you, that was something because I really was, didn't know who a lot of these people were. I'm a theater organist. I wasn't listening to anything but Jesse Crawford and uh, George Wright, Lynn Larson, and it's theater organ stuff. But because of my PA, the Keel Auditorium Management had heard about it because I'd done a few jobs around there. And uh, so we did that and oh my, it was, it was really something. He was freaked out about it because they hadn't been ever played through anything like I didn't know that. They brought up a bunch of people from Nashville. Dolly Parton was only 24. I think uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, Buck Owens, little Jimmy Din Dickens and all these guys had come up on Sunday afternoon at Keel and I really got my my way with all of that, really having fun. Started building a la large sound system. I got totally out of the music business as far as playing. And uh, we were we were just really making it happen. And, and what was crazy about it is that's the mixer we had for all this. It was only six channels. That's all there was in 1967 and 68. It was an Alltech mixer, it really was a, used in broadcast stations. But uh, I mixed all these people with that. And uh, I also took a 30 inch speaker out of an Electro Voice hi fi cabinet to partition and built a bass speaker with an amplifier. And I was leasing it to people. Noel Redding was a bass player for Jimi Hendrix, took it on the rest of his tour. All types of, of, of bands heard about this guy in Marissa, Illinois, ye old music shop. It's like, whoa. So it, it, things turned very quickly in my life, I have to tell you. But again, building things, that was very important to me. Uh, that little mixer, uh, that's not going to make it. But I had heard about Longevin. They built studio equipment and they had just announced in 1968 that they were coming out with a mixer. It was an eight channel mixer and it was amazing. Whoa, this would be great. And so I contacted them and I, yeah, I think we should do this. And so I bought a pair of them. And I had a carpenter in Marissa, he was a cabinet builder and he built a cabinet for the pair of those. And uh, wow, it, it, the word got out really fast. The cabinet was really nice uh, and we bought two of them. So I had 16 channels. Now you think about this for a minute. <laughs> Bands that had four and five, six channels and here comes this clown from Marissa that had 16. Also that uh, the the little box above it with two meters, that was a compression and limiting amplifier. But here's what got all of us uh, really fired up. In the upper right, this is 1968, there wasn't anything about equalization. When I talk about that, people will look at me like, uh, well, we're gonna get into that in a minute. Equalization wasn't heard of. And so here comes Longevin, and this is what they built. 
whoa, yeah, baby. And uh, it was the first graphics. And that was in my console. So you can imagine rolling into a, a concert hall with all of this gear and the big speakers. We were really doing well with all of the groups. And that's a whole nother story. But I'd been off the air now for 12 years. I get back on the air and, oh man, I'm going, what happened to my great Art Collins audio, you guys? I was shocked because this is what I heard a lot of and I couldn't believe it. CQ, 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 field day, CQ, field day, CQ, field day, CQ, field day, from kilowatt time. I'm going, wait a minute, what happened to my Art Collins kilowatt audio? Kilowatt there were still a few out there. Oscar Julian Yankee. Ah, there were some that still had it together, but the majority of people, uh, they just didn't have it. And so I figured it's time for me to do something. And I did. In 1982, I built the very first equalizer for ham radio. It was a two band equalizer. And I had figured out what frequencies, because see, it's important that these filters are on the right frequency. And I, I met with a group on 7240 when I first got back into ham radio. We were on every night. They were very, very knowledgeable guys. And we all worked on our filters that I built and um, came up with the EQ200. And so I, I wrote an article in QST. I sent it to QST. They called me and said, this is a revelation. This has never been done before. We've been checking. The ARRL says, oh, no, we haven't heard of any equalization. And so I wrote the article. They printed it. It became the lead article in July 1982 and got the cover award. So things were really ramping up. I had closed the plant uh, where we had a... Oh, gosh, we had 35 people working in that plant in Marissa, building all kinds of things and uh, speakers and uh, uh, amplifiers and things like that for the rock bands. But I had gotten totally out of that whole business. We did a lot of rock festivals. I wrote the book for them on Practical Guide for Concert Sound. One of the guys I met up with was in the James gang. I did his concert uh, for about, we were with him about a year back in uh, 68 and 69, right in there. Joe and I found out we we're both hams. So we've been friends ever since. And uh, we did all kinds of things together. But he said, hey, I need your help. He said, I, I recorded an album in Nashville. And when I was there, there was a guy there that owned the studio, Pete Drake. He was a real gadgeteer. He had taken a little three-inch speaker and a funnel and put it in a little bitty box, had a piece of little tube on it. And when he drove that speaker with his guitar amp, very low level where he'd blow it up, it was, an, it was one of the very first talk box type sounds. Uh, and it made his steel guitar kind of sing. Joe used that because he recorded in Pete Drake's studio. Uh, Dottie and Bill West were good friends with Joe, and they invited him to come down to do that. So uh, now, uh, now what am I going to do? I mean, we uh, <laughs> we're going to go on tour. <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with that. <laughs> what are we going to do, Heil? We actually put Barnstorm together. That was his solo band after the James Gang. And he said, we ain't do that about the box thing. And so I took a, a 100 watt driver, JVL driver, and we put it in a box. I had a uh, fiberglass uh, shop that we were building fiberglass horns and stuff 
So we actually built a little cabinet for it. I built five of them, big deal. This is, we built several different adaptations of that case. But anyway, that was the start of the talk box. And to fast forward that, uh, I did almost every concert that Humble Pie did in their career. And one of the lead guitar players in their early days was a young Peter Frampton. And uh, Peter had this little gal friend, Penny McCall. Penny was living in Marissa. She had gotten next to one of the Humble Pie roadie guys. She got next to one of the roadie guys. We had five or six uh, road people lived in Marissa. My dad had some rental houses and we had all kinds of bands and that lived in Marissa. And so she, uh, she was living there, but she got together with Peter. She was married in my home to one of the uh, roadies. But after she left him and got with Peter, she called me one day and said, uh, I need a Christmas present for Peter. Don't send me a guitar. He's got a lot of them. She said, so send me something. Well, you know what I did. I sent him a talk box. And you can write the rest of that history. <laughs> Peter's, he became a really dear friend all these years. And uh, he's uh, now retired from touring. Uh, he, he's just sitting around in Nashville and recording some blues and stuff. And we're very dear friends. And he, he still maintains that the talk box made his career, which it did. But those are some of those early things that, I, you know, I, I launched my career. And several of them. Uh, I was in the home theater business. We did a lot of that. And we're not talking about little uh, $400. We're talking about three, $300,000, $400,000 rooms with high def. 1985, think about this. The only way we got high def was on laser disc. And then we got into satellite. I was an early satellite dealer, but put in thousands of satellite systems in Southern Illinois. And uh, it, it was uh, quite an in inspiration for me when I got with, with Tim White. We were on KMOX for 25 years every Wednesday night with High Tech Heil, talking about gadgets when the cell phones weren't out and all that. But I also was hired by the Hubbard family who owned the very first K-Band license. And that was... Uh, that was where we could use what two foot dishes right and then so it was a, a real early uh, test that they wanted to do they had 10 of these around the country i was one of them in 91 they'd send test shots down well in 1994 it was there i, I was on the ces consumer electronic show floor on abc television telling them it's here direct tv and the vice president of rca came down that weekend uh, when it was introduced uh Heil sound was the first dealer to sell the very first one in america and we put the first one in a home out in the west county the president wanted to see how it all went that's a picture of our present building in those days it was home theater and uh, satellite stuff they brought in the nipper and chipper uh, RCA on that opening day. But I was working with all kinds of people. Uh, with Ray Dolby, we spotlighted his new uh, ProLogic. And it was just on and on and on and on. But again, I, I kind of got back out of that. Long about that time, I got a call from Paul. I'm not talking about Paul Braun. We're talking about Paul Clips. <laughs> It says, are you the guy that's got that, that kilowatt? You got it? Big sound system. He went on and on. I said, I am. I want to come and see this. So he flew his airplane up to Marissa. And all day long, 
it's like, why did you do this? How come you did that? And then he'd say, well, where'd you learn to do that? You, what, what college? I didn't go to, I hardly made it to high school. Where'd you learn this? Ham radio. No, where, where did you learn it? No, no, ham radio. And that got, really got to me many, many times. I'd go into these big arenas doing things that nobody had ever thought about. And it worked. Where'd you learn to do this? Ham radio. No, you don't understand. Like, no, you don't understand. That is why I take my, my time to share this with all of you because ham radio is an amazing place to learn things. And we're going to really get into it here. Paul put me in his plane that night, flew down to Hope, Arkansas, his home. And he had a, uh, it was a telephone exchange building that had been vacant for years. That was his laboratory. And there's a shot of the inside of his K horn. He was the first guy to build a corner horn. Uh, very, very efficient. It fit into the corner. Of course, he made this one out of plexiglass so you could see it work. It fit into the corner of your room with eight foot to the left and eight foot to the right. That was the last of the 16 foot of the horn, which was your room. You were actually sitting in the speaker. If you've never experienced a K horn, and you ever had to get a chance to do it, oh yeah, it's really something. But all days, it's why are you doing this and how come you did? And he's showing me things. You got to go to study this. We got to get you studying on the, the Bell Labs. And you need to learn a lot more about audio. And I agreed. And so, as I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to turn you to the studies of Bell Labs. You have it really easy. You can go to DuckDuckGo or uh, Google. I had to go to the library. It took a long time. It was a year or so before I really got, un got it under my, uh, myself that this is what was really happening. The early telephone system did not work well. It was mushy. It was clear, had no speech articulation of any kind. They put a, a pair of wires together in New Jersey and across America, every 50 miles was a relay station. It kept the voltage up, kept the current up. And so their idea was by the time they got out to the West Coast, this is what they were going to see and what they were going to hear. Nope, wasn't even close. And so they put 4,000 scientists. You can't make this up, everybody. This is documented and you'll read about it. There were 4,000 scientists in the Bell Labs. They did all kinds of things, but they had to fix this telephone system. It wasn't working. So they put the two lead guys, Dr. Harvey Fletcher and Dr. Weldon Munson. On. Whoa, they found out an amazing thing. It was all about our ears. We don't hear flat. And in order for us to hear speech, it can't be mushy and bassy. We need some articulation. And so here's what happened. I'm going to change microphones. Okay. That, by the way, was our... Pro 77 that a lot of radio stations are using these days. Okay. This is a PR 22 that I was commissioned by Paul Rogers of Bad Company to build. He wanted a microphone that didn't uh, you need a lot of equalization because he didn't feel his uh, front of the house guys could do it well. <laughs> and as you hear, there's no EQ in this, but it's great. But here's the deal. The telephone system is 300 to 3,000. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Take a look at your single sideband transmitter. Hmm? About the same. But what they found out was there's something about 2.5K. Hmm. Here's the graph of that. I should show you this first. Here's what they discovered. 
that after all of this going through, they needed to take a look at what was going to happen between 300 and 3,500. See that big rise? It's 2.5K. It's at least 4, 5, 6 dB above everything else. Now, pay attention. I have a parametric equalizer in this mixer. All I am touching is the 2.5K. I'm not touching the base, the treble, nothing. Here we go. And when I take it out, listen what happened. Uh-oh. Hmm. The F and the S, P and the B, the essence of sound is simply not stunning anymore. It's difficult to understand, just like that sideband transmitter I let you hear right at the first. That has to have 2.5K. Now, all I'm going to do is bring back 2.5K. I'm going to bring it up at about 6 dB. There it is right there. Now the essence of sound is simply stunning. I'll take it out again. The essence of sound is gone. So you're trying to call these foreign DX stations, and they're not sure if you have an S or an F or a B or a P. I'm going to put it back. There it is back. All I was doing was raising that middle bar, either taking it out or putting it back. But now that they had discovered the problem, how are they going to fix it? There were no equalizers in that period. There weren't any. So the thing they had to do was use high and low pass filters, which can be named as some equalization because that's exactly what it is, but it's not variable. You see, the, the high pass filter, the size of the capacitor, you bring full range through it. Depending on the size of that, you're going to take all of it through and how much of it through. In their case, they want to roll off that low end a little, so they take a resistor to ground. The low pass filter is the reverse of that. To pass low frequencies, you go through the resistor onto the amplifier, but the capacitor to ground, depending on the size of it, will take the highs away. And that was the way they fixed the telephone system for years. And it went that way for a good decade. Nothing more was said about EQ until this wonderful little genius, we need to erect a, a, a statue to John Volkman. Look how young he was. He was working at RCA in the 1920s, but they put him in a very special place. They had to equalize motion picture playback systems. The talkies were in. Uh-huh. But they couldn't understand the words. And so John Volkman, he figured a way that he could use some high-pass and low-pass filters and kind of make a Rube, Bul uh, Rube Goldberg equalizer. He, he had different low pass and different high pass. And by that big switch, he could, he could pick out which ones that he wanted to solder in place. I mean, these are not like, you know, equalization. Well, that remained. Now, check this out. That was 1930. Nothing happened on the equalization front until the late 50s when uh, late 40s into the 50s when the hi-fi movement came in that paul clips had a big part to play well they needed some equalization and all they did for that was they did the, the passive uh, uh, high pass and low pass filters and they'd use some variable resistors and caps and that's how you got minor equalization in the early hi-fi stages we still haven't had it happening until 1967 about 1920 30 to 67 nothing really was happening in the equalization front it was langevin the company that was building K 
gear for studios. They came up with this really cool thing they called an equalizer. You'll see at the top, a little knob where you could select the frequency and you could raise it or lower it, cut or boost. That was something. I remember when it came out, I had just gotten into the sound reinforcement business. And that's what turned me on to Longevin. But shortly after they came up with that, we talked about a while ago. So equalization was really happening. Symmetrics came out with what is today the standard in radio and TV stations. It's a, the the picture at the top is the whole thing. That's got compression, limiting, uh, noise gates, a de-esser. If you had a, a, a person that had uh, exited a lot of airs and S's, you could get rid of them with the de-esser. And then the three band on the bottom, three band parametric. A parametric EQ is the most amazing thing ever, but it's a little bit difficult. One, once you get it, it's simple. You can change. You, you are the engineer. It's not like just hitting a button and or raising treble bass. No, you have to figure out where. Notice here, I've set the, the lows at 150 hertz. The octave, that's the bandwidth of this audio filter. Is it going to reach down below or is it going to go up to 300? That's that's what you can change the bandwidth. Then you have plus or minus. I'm going to minus it. What's the next one? This is what I had on my station over here for my AM transmitter that's 6K wide. 2.5K. I want pretty much the bandwidth. And I want to crank that baby plus 60B. And then the top is at 6K. We're going to come back to this. Oh, are we going to come back to this? <laughs> 1999, I got a letter from Dr. Inouye, Inouye Communications icon. He had a picture of his station in Japan. He had the IC781. That was a, an incredible transceiver that the, a lot of the... Uh, contest and DX guys used. It was wonderful. It was the first one that had a screen in it. It actually was a CRT screen. He wrote this letter and he showed a picture of that. And in that picture was my EQ 200. Whoa. And that wasn't enough. He had one of my gold line microphones. I have to tell you, boys and girls, I was, <laughs> I was shocked, stunned, and I guess thrilled, but whoa, he, he, he wrote this letter, I'm thinking of new radio line, and I want to use equalization. He had found out how well this all worked. He was the first company to bring equalization into ham radio on a major level from the pro one pro two pro three all the way through the lineup even until this little guy i would hope that some of you have this this is the best toy i have my goodness he sent this over for us to build a headset microphone for this is the 705 it's a 7300 Plus, it has two meters and D star in it. It runs on a battery, or you can plug it into 12 volts. It is an amazing little radio, uh, great receiver. It's a 7300. And so they sent it over so I can build a, a, a headset for it, which we have. But we started out with, with all of these rigs for years and a lot of the things that really I was pointing daggers at me on there yeah I, I got the new icom pro 3 or whatever uh, but, uh, not using that eq thing you don't need that 
well, yes, you do. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, oh, I better get with the program. So we have all kinds of stuff on our site that makes it real easy because it is easy. Before you, now catch all, listen up. Before you sit down at any transmitter, you have to tell it what you're going to do. Are you going to do contest work? Are you going to do rag chew? You got to tell them what's going to happen here because you're going to set the bandwidth filter. It's the first thing you do. You don't do any, you don't even worry about band you're going to be on. You set that bandwidth filter if you're going to use it for normal conversation to 100 to 2900. Give you a nice low end. It's not a big old boomy bass because once you do that, you go up to the equalizer, you notch the base, minus two for a good start. And that's at 160 hertz. I set that. Dr. Inouye put that in there. You don't have to worry about it. All you get to do is plus or minus. So we're going to roll off that base. The treble is, you know where it is. It's a 2.5K, and you're going to plus the heck out of it. What are you doing contesting? Huh? Well, I don't want any low end, nothing. So you set that at 500 hertz to 2,500. You go up and notch out everything you can on the base EQ, and you punch that 2.5 as hard as you can. You now have the worst sounding signal on the radio. Yeah, it's terrible. However, watch the screen. This is not some kind of little magic or little toy act. This is very beneficial. You're never going to forget it. Remember, we opened up the door for 2.5K, right? We lowered the base and we set that bandwidth. Now, if we're going to set that bandwidth for rag chew, uh, if if that air was RF, then you see what's happening. It's all kind of nice with a little rise at 2.5. But what about the DXers? I want all of my power at 2.5. That I, I've proved to you a couple of times. You want all of it there to get that maximum speech articulation. And so now when you narrow this up, and if you've opened the door to 2.5K, where is your RF going? It's got to go somewhere. You know where it's going. It's going to 2.5. And now you're going to be the top dog because your, your, your articulation is just smashing right through all the noise and stuff. And, and it's that tr that's true with everything. And... and all the ICOMs that they have the same EQ in them, they just have a different way of doing the graphics. This is the 7851 and all that. Dr. Anyway also asked me to build the proper microphone for it because these companies don't build their own, they just buy them from an OEM company. They're not matching. Who well, came in the box, Bob? Yeah, okay. But it's not all that really good. And so he asked me to do this, and we did. This is the most marvelous microphone for all ICOMs. It's wonderful. Doesn't cost very much. I made sure of that. And all you have to do is watch your ALC meter. That's how you set mic gain. You don't get on the air and say, hey, Bill, how do I sound? Turn it down. No, turn it. No. You're the engineer. You own the license. So you go in and watch your ALC meter. <clears throat> when I did the Yesu 9000, I got my way on that one. There is no ALC. It's lettered mic gain, that meter. That's all it is. What else is that meter good for? It's there for a purpose, but they don't ever tell you what the purpose is. That's how you set mic gain. You can really make things happen if you get things set. While we're here, after that happened, that first uh, uh, Pro One came out, 
at Dayton, Dr. Hasegawa, who owns his family, owns Jesu, he comes into my booth. I wanted to do it better. I, oh, excuse me. <laughs> <It'll>, <clears throat> we're talking about equalization. Hmm. Well, we could do a parametric. Yeah, that'd be good. I said, nah, not so fast. Why not? Education. What, what do you mean? <laughs> well, we did all the thinking for you here. All you get to do is plus or minus, and that's fine. But a parametric, as you saw a minute ago, uh-uh. It has three. I put three filters in that radio because that's all you really need. Three filters. But you don't have one or two knobs. You have nine. And you have to figure out what each one of them are. Here, it's already spilled out for you. Oh, no. And so, off to the races. <laughs> and their, uh, their uh, manuals are terrible. I mean, I designed that equalizer for all of the Yesus. <laughs> I they got all these graphs and they I don't know, I can't make it out. How in the heck can a guy that bought the radio? But it's very simple when you look at it like this. There are three filters. They each have three things to adjust: frequency, level, bandwidth frequency level bandwidth i set the first one at 200 because i'm going to roll it off i don't want a whole lot of bass so i take it to minus three or four a bandwidth we're going to do two octaves just do it at two octaves that'll be fine but what about that second one where you where do you set it see that's where people get in trouble they don't know where to set it there's something about audio all my many, many, many hundreds and thousands of concerts and things I've done. We go into these arenas and there's something about nine, 800 to 1200 actually. It's a boxy sound. Do this to your ears. And that boxy sound, as you talk, it's there all the time. I don't know what causes it, but it's there, especially in, in, in your radio. So we're going to set it at 900 and we're going to notch it three or four dB, two in the bandwidth. But where are you going with the third? You know where we're going, or I did a terrible job earlier. It's 2.5K. Now I fuzzed out all of the other because here's what confuses a lot of people. Those are just assignment numbers. 101, 102, 103, but they're different for every radio, so every Yesu. So I don't know why they do that. Just give us those nine figures so we're there. Now, the first thing you have to do is what? Set the bandwidth. That's a separate little notch. And Yesu, unlike all the others, you have to make sure you save it, just like a computer, because that's what it is. You have to hold the memory button in for about two or three seconds. After you do this, or all of this is for naught. And uh, the bandwidth's kind of neat. I'll show you this graph. This audio bandwidth, uh, the wider bandwidth is, as you see it with the red, uh, it's the difference between the lower frequency and the higher. The green is a little narrower. And the blue is real narrow. I always set it about halfway in the bandwidth number and yeah, everybody's fine. But I had to build a microphone for Yesu also. And we did the PR781. I don't care what kind of radio you have. This is it. This is it. It also has become the podcaster's dream microphone. It is gorgeous. And I'm very proud of it. It's a PR40 with the low end knocked off but as i'm using here i'm really favored to the pr22 because it's got a 4 db rise at 22k and uh, i i really love this and it's not very expensive it's on one of our lb1s it's a lit base when you push to push to talk down the bass lights up <laughs> but the microphone's balanced and it, it's it's wonderful stuff i have to tell you we we just have so much fun bringing you things that means things to people because a lot of times there's stuff out there and nobody cares they don't care but you just want to make sure that you set things up for what you're going to do you uh, be sure to punch up that 2.5 roll off the base you get a nice 
pleasant balance of high and low. But for DX, uh uh, is it going to be in your face? It's going to sound terrible. But look where all of your all of your power goes. If you happen to have a radio that doesn't have EQ, there's some really cool ones out there. Julius Jones has a really nice one. It's been around for a long, long time. And that's uh, his eight band uh, EQ. Wonderful stuff. I mean, excellent. And now I've, I ran across another one that, Sergi, you sent this over, UR6QW. Look that up. Oh, man. Sergi's got a terrific uh, EQ. And it's not really expensive. Well, neither one is. But just a, a couple of options for you. The other thing that you have to think about is you have a radio that have bandwidth filters. And a lot of people, what does that mean? Well, most of the radios today are at 2.9, but there's a few of them that aren't. Their widest filter is at 2.4. And because the guys and gals might not know what's going on there, They'll buy a PR781 or they'll buy a PR40 calling me saying, this thing's a piece of junk. It sounds terrible. Can't get any low end. That's because your radio is doing that. Here is the reason. Take a listen. Now pay attention. This is very important because here's the difference. This is K9EID and we're transmitting a 2.9K with this is 2.4K, and as you note, it's nice and it's articulate, but the whole bottom end drops out because of the filter network. We'll go back to uh, 2.9. Now, this is the uh, the 2.9, and it's much smoother, has much more fidelity. And so you have to pay attention to the bandwidth filters, TBW. Uh, it's so important. And again, when I read through the manuals, I just want to kill somebody because they're not done very well. And uh, for the contesters, we have since 1984, 85, I came up with the with the D DX contest dream machine. They call it the HC4. It's now called an HC74. These things are amazing, but they sound awful. Well, why would you do that, Heil? Well, you know why I did it. Here, I'm going to prove it to you. Listen to this. This is my DX element. And yes, it sounds terrible. But where are where is all of the articulation, the essence of sound, the S's, the P's, they're all there. So when you get some really wild call coming through the DX, you can tell them what your call is. It's very important. And so that's why I developed elements to do that almost automatically for you. Very important. And uh, while I'm here, I'm very proud of this headset. It took me a couple of years to do this. I was noticing a couple of companies trying to, uh, to come up with the uh, David Clark that's the that's the three thousand dollar headset that you see pilots wear and aircraft and all that this one certainly is not that but it behaves like it first of all I did things to answer you I have a lot of requests from people I got one today from a guy what why don't you do this anyway <laughs> it has the interchangeable elements we have a, a broad element for our broadcasters we have a rag two element to HC7, and then we have this crazy HC74. I like the seven myself. It does everything you need. Mm -hmm. But it has a balance control, a balance control from left to right, so that if you have a hearing imbalance, no problem. I also, all of my headsets, if you think they're too uncomfortable, you haven't read the, the instructions. All have a piece of steel underneath the padding 
If you have a pinhead like me, fine. But if you have a larger head, don't be afraid to adjust it. It won't break. I also put an output jack for the monitor. So you don't need Y cords. Like at field day, if you got an operator and a logger or contest, you don't need any, any other Y cord. Just plug his or her headset into that jack. Bingo. He can hear that she can hear what you're doing. But then the biggie. It's the only headset. We've been doing this since I think around 2003 that has phase reversal. And you're going to say, in a headset? What is that for? Ask any DXer and they'll tell you it's their key to receiving. Because you go here, a, a, a pile up, and you got this little bitty wiki guy back here. You reverse the phase of these speakers and he jumps up front. You can actually move signals around in your head acoustically. It's amazing. And it's, it's all about science and phasing. We're going to get into that big time here in a minute. But one thing I can tell you that you could go away with, if you don't have an oscilloscope, please do it. I see oscilloscopes at Hamfest and on uh, eBay and stuff. These are two and three thousand uh, dollar wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, oscilloscopes. And these babies, uh, I bought that one for three hundred dollars. That's a B and K, and it's like, what in the world? But these are things that you need. But okay, so now what? How do I hook it up? Oh, that's the easiest part. You build this little box. The center of that is a piece of RG8 coax. It just con connects one of the connectors to the other. You'll see the diagram up there. It just feeds the input to the output, but we tap it. It takes two resistors and a capacitor to tap it, and that goes to that scope input. That wasn't hard, was it? But now you want a signal that looks clean like that. You can tell immediately if you have a problem. And it's not expensive. You look around, you'll see oscilloscopes. I've, I've even seen a lot of people just give them away because they can't get rid of them. Well, <laughs> that's because a lot of guys in the business, they need you know, 150 meg stuff. We don't need that. Gosh, if we have a 30 meg scope, we're fine. And uh, so please look at that. That's, that's a wonderful thing for you. The other thing we want to talk about is how to use a microphone. What do you mean? How are you talking to it? Uh-huh. Well, that's not <laughs> always the case. I hear so many guys that are two feet from their microphone and they're so boomy, the room sound like a roller rink. They just turn up the gain. Well, yeah, but you just pick up everything, including the neighbor's dog. When you get into the studying of the 4,000 scientists, they will tell you two inches from the source. No more. Two inches. So if you do have a desk stand, get into it. That is exactly why when I entered this, this business, I brought booms to it. And that all happened when I brought the equalizer around in 82, because I'm always busy. I'm always soldering things. The same here, a little bench right here. <laughs> I've always got stuff going on. <laughs> and if I'm on the air, I never just am on the air. I'm doing something. So that's how I get a lot of stuff done. But anyway, you want to make sure that you're no more than two inches. And that really makes it nice uh, to do a boom that, that's like that. Just the distance of the microphone. Because here's the biggie. Pay attention to this one. Pay attention. Again, the scientist told me this. When you double the distance, you lose six decibel. Think about that. You double your power, that's 3 dB. 
to go from 500 watts to a kilowatts, 3 dB, you're going to toss six of it away. Well, it's so easy to make up just by staying on the microphone. And you want to be sure to use one of these. We, we send these with all of our microphones. There's a couple of models we don't, but we have them. Why do you need this? Every human exits air when we speak, some a lot more than others. And when they do, the air drives the diaphragm down into the voice coil. So the P's and the, all the poppy, 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 poppy. Get rid of it. Poppy, poppy's gone. But warning. Don't go to Walmart or wherever and pay a dollar for one of these things. It has to be acoustically transparent. It's not just a piece of foam. I heard a guy the other day, he put his sock over his microphone. He was so muffled up, I couldn't hear him. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But all this stuff is there on our website. You want to visit our website, hylesound.com, and you'll see all things ICOM. All Things Yesu, Kenwood, Ellicraft, and there's several others. There's a lot of stuff there. And you want to go check it out because it's very important. Very. In 2006, Joe is needing some help. So Sarah and I, we, we bought a, a condo out in uh, Seal Beach, California, so we could be close and help him. While we're there, we're sitting at his kitchen table one day, and he said, hey, I want you to build me a better microphone. What are you talking about? Well, he said, you know, these ball things we got, we got to just stay right here. You think about it now. I opened up a big door for you to think about something. You always see these guys with that ball mic stuck in their mouth. Why? Because it won't work any other way. He wants a microphone that you can move around. And so I developed a microphone that you can be 180 degrees around and it never goes away. You close your eyes and you would never know that I moved this extravagantly from one side to the other. But then he said, you know, when I used to come through there and you were on two meters with that big antenna and I'd call you in the bus when you were out a few miles from Marissa, I didn't hear you when you turned it around. Why can't you do that to my microphone? Well, I can. Well, do it. He said, I want to be able to get rid of all these guys behind me. And he said, so build me a microphone that we can move around in the front, but we won't have anything coming from the back. And so I did. Let me grab one of these. I came up with a microphone that would do all of that. You probably never heard of a thing like power focus in a microphone because none of the microphones in ham radio do that. But ours, I spent several years studying those scientists. There's so much stuff. And we developed a lot of very special microphones because of it. We also have a custom shop where we can put your call on it or whatever. But Joe said, okay, you got to get rid of that low end, uh, that uh, rear rejection. He said, what are you going to do about it? Well, here's what we're going to do about it. You might have seen this before, but you're going to have to suffer through it again because not might every not maybe everybody didn't see this before. And even if you did, it's nice to review and unplug this. My favorite subject of phasing. I mean, my very favorite subject. But you never read about it. Nobody wants to talk to you about it. And it's sad. And in the next five or 10 minutes, you're going to see why I am so disgusted that it's not a top priority for a lot of people. 
These two microphones are in phase. When I talk into both of them, it goes up, what? 3 dB, I doubled, I doubled the input. So the source went double, so did my, my output. You sometimes can see it on my Duro meter behind me over my shoulder, because 3 dB, here we go, we're gonna take it away. There's 3 dB, it's gone, okay? Still sounds the same, and you didn't hear it, because you can't detect 3 dB. That's the kicker. The human being cannot detect 3 dB. Oh, if you were in an N echo chamber, <laughs> maybe, maybe you could. And, and, you know, that brings up a whole other point. I mean, we're talking about something that looks like this. <laughs> if you were in one of those, you could hear 3 dB. How's that work? It's really cool. If you've never been in one of those, that's a screened floor that's about 10 feet full of these things underneath. That's how we measure things and make really good scientific measurements on speakers and microphones or anything audio. What happens is the, the source goes in and it hits the one and goes in. And by the time it gets to the back one, it's gone. It's really eerie because it, it, it kind of spooky actually, but oh buddy, um, what are we gonna do? Just something to think about. But now we're going to do the biggie. This is what I came for. This is a little plug. Mm -hmm. Plug this. I've hooked pin two to three and three to two to backwards. These are balance line microphones. Well, it doesn't sound any different. Doesn't have, nothing's different. Well, yeah, this one is out of phase, but it sounds the same, Heil. Listen what happens when I take two microphones are two sources out of phase. Here we go. Nothing, nothing. The bomb could go off and you wouldn't hear it because they're canceling. This one goes down when I speak the diaphragm. This one, it's out of phase, it comes up. So it's gone. Aha, the platform I needed for my friend Joe. I came up with the now famous PR40. It's a microphone that I never dreamed what was going to happen. First of all, we're the only company that came up with a large diaphragm. Everything out there, the ball mics, all the stuff you see, they're little three quarter inch, maybe an inch in diameter. This thing's an inch and three eighths. It's huge. And we figured out how to tame it. I had a sure engineer come to me the year after we brought this under the market. I want to know how we did it because they failed. They couldn't make it work. Well, it was two hams on Joe's kitchen table. We figured it out. And that's, that's not a lie. I'm not making that up. You can go ask Bob Shuline. Oh, you can't. They fired him. They said they don't need their engineers anymore. At least that's what he told me. Okay, here's the deal. We know what the front's like. Watch this screen because this is this is incredible. This microphone is 40 dB down in the rear. Here we go. Oh, it still works. Oh, yeah, but it's 40 down. 40 down. Think about that. How did I do that? Well, here's how I did it. And it was very simple, very simple. I have that large diaphragm element up on top. All other microphones, every single solitary one of the dynamic mics have four little holes around up here to let the rear come up underneath the diaphragm because it would be out of phase, right? And it would cancel, right? Well, that's not enough, those four little holes. And so I open up the whole bottom. 360 degrees around and set it up on a shock mount on top of what we call the signal correction collection tube. All these signals come flying up the mids, the highs, the lows. 
into the bottom. And that's how we get 40 dB of rear ejection. Wow, it's a crazy ham to figure that out. We did the same thing to that. However, I uh, rolled off the low end because this microphone, the PR40, gets down to 28 cycles. I don't know of any other diaphragm that'll do that. The RE20 only gets down to about 25, right? No, it gets down to about 30, come on. So we're just rocking and rolling the PR30, uh, uh, the PR40 has become our flagship. And, and I see it in all kinds of places. It's being used in, into the recording studios, Sirius Radio just tossed all their RE20s and bought 250 of the PR40s. All kinds of people that are using it, especially in the broadcast world. And, and we're just so, ble so pleased and, and really blessed. Uh, the PR40, even Mickey Mouse is using it, believe it or not. We did all the microphones for Last Man Standing. That was a fun thing. But it's almost all everything I do is about phasing. And again, those headsets were the choice of the of the contest in DX Ops for 35 years. So a lot of our stuff has to do with phasing. Think about this. When Wes Shum came to single side bend, brought it into ham radio, how'd he get rid of the carrier? How do you get rid of the other sideband? We only, it, you, it's single sideband. How did your notch filter work when some idiot flies on your frequency and doesn't care about you? You hit the notch filter. How's that work? Puts his signal out of phase. We'll see you later, buddy. And so on. But then you look at antennas. How did Dr. Yagi? build the Yagi antenna. He didn't have modeling, whatever that is. He didn't have anything but a, a field strength meter that he built with a 1N34 diode and a meter and a driven element that was resonant. All antennas must be resonant in my world. And it wasn't his. And so he had a whole bunch of aluminum and he'd start moving them in and out different sizes. And when he hit the magic spot, he could get gain. No batteries needed. He would come behind with a longer element at the right place. It was out of phase from that driven bingo. It notched out the signal. I always thought, you know, what would be cool would be to do a phased array. But oh, man, we're talking just all kinds of money and stuff. I started researching it. K3LR, the big contest station. And um, I, I visited uh, with him a couple of times. And Tim Duffy said, no, it's not a big deal. And it isn't. I went to the co-op, electric co-op, and they had all kinds of, of uh, used telephone poles. They, they'll have like 90-foot poles, and they might have got rot rotted off. So I got me a couple of 60-footers, put them up in the ground, and they were 64 foot apart. We're doing, we're doing wavelengths here, everybody. You're gonna learn in a minute how important that is. You can't just stick them in the air. They have to be exact, 64 and 64. And the lead links, the down lead link has to be 126 foot on 75 meters. But now notice what happens. There's a relay out there, 500 foot from the, from the shack. They're all tied together, both of the down leads and that with 43 foot of phasing line. But I can switch to the front one or to the back one, depending on what direction I wanted. If I go to the left, the rear one is delayed. That's what phasing is all about. And I put these up. I had a pair of 75 meter. I used a fiberglass pole because I didn't want any kind of metal to cause any uh, problem. And then I went 33 foot up the poles and did a 40 meter. Here's what happened. Pay attention 
and you will not believe how easy this was. The installation of a 75 meter phased array antenna system consisting of a pair of coaxial dipoles mounted atop a pair of 55 foot telephone poles. We put them in an inverted V fashion and the poles are 64 foot apart. These are 500 foot from the operating position fed with RG213. In order to make the antennas directive from east to west, we use a delay line of 43 foot here on 75 meters that's switched in and out of the driven element, either east or west. The down lead length is 126 foot. We take all of that coax, the down lead length, the 43 foot phasing delay line, and mounted them in a container, one of the plastic container boxes that we actually buried and just the top of it shows. It's all sealed, so it's waterproof, but that's the way we get to switch all the components from 500 foot using one of the Amatron RCS 8V remote switches. It really works well. Take a listen to how we can get at least 10 to 20 dB difference east to west. Like a lot of people do, I, mine's usually three inches or so, it, you know, that's just after you done mow it. And uh, I know, you know, probably, uh, uh, you know, we get a dry day. I'm I'm gonna have to lay out there and mow. That's just all there is to it. Because you know, if you leave it that high, when it starts growing in it all, it's looking right. It's looking ragged pretty quick. So uh, it's uh, it's to that point now. And uh, the system really performs on weak signals. Take a listen as we switch to the direction they're coming from. Also note the preamplifier makes no difference on 75 meters on this signal. The preamplifier, of course, make the meter read higher, but in many cases, the preamplifier does not cause the weak signal. What happened here? <laughs> the video decides to quit. So uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. One of the things that you noted about that is no matter how strong the signals are, uh, you can notch them. And I, I in most of my my experiments with we this, just I was I instant. was getting somewhere close to twenty dB as you saw, and, and it's it's just amazing stuff. Uh, I'll come back to that. You can do this with verticals. And it's, it, it's just so easy to do any of these. Uh, here's the vertical setup. Um, let's see if I can make this happen over here. There we go. Um, it's the same setup uh, when you're, you know, when you're doing vertical, horizontal, whatever, you have the same lead length boxes and so on. And it's, it's so simple. Again, you have that delay line that's the important factor and if you want to do this on 40 meters it's really easy and uh, i we use the the switch box that the uh, they come with that's the uh ameritron dx engineering also builds a really good one i use that one too but i don't like rotary switches no there's, there's what I do. I go to Antique Electric Supply in Mesa, Arizona. And these are Les Paul guitar switches. So instead of having to rotate that switch, one, two, three, I just do it there. I mean, they're here behind me in this console to switch all the different antennas, as well as the colored ones are for the different, uh, uh, the different uh, rigs. And so there, there's just all kinds of ways to do these things. Uh, a friend of mine, K8MN, his name happens to be da, Dave Heil, but he's not a relation. This is what he does. He's on a very small lot and he's a 20 meter DX hound. This is what he does. And man, does that thing work? And he's using the same relay switching. And, and it, 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 again, it, it, it's, it's wonderful. But then you have to talk about height. This really bugs me. You don't hear much about this, but there was, I got hip to it years back uh, when I was in Marissa. 
we had a group on 7240 every night. And I, I put up a reference antenna of 40 meters. And every night for one month, I had a different antenna, a different configuration, different feed lines, different heights, different antennas. And we all, and we, we had, uh, there were about six of us around the country. And we all verified each night what was best, bad, whatever. Well, hmm. The simple, simple dipole won every time. Nobody ever did not choose that because I wouldn't tell them when I was on. And you see all of these silly other things that people try to sell. No, this is it right here. But it's got to be resonant. You cut that for 68 divided by, you, you know, you've seen it. You've learned it to take your test. But here's what you didn't learn, I bet you. I didn't, and I didn't know this because what happened every night we'd do these things. Well, once we centered on that the dipole was it, I had I, I had a, about a 70 foot tower. We started out at 20 foot on 40 meters. Now I had a reference antenna so we could really each night because things would vary each night. I went to 30 foot. I went to 40 foot and it got a little worse. Really? I went to the quarter wave. When I put my 40 meter antenna to 33 foot, I got another S unit out of what it was at 50 feet. This is not anything I'm making up. This is science. And here is why. I just hate it that I don't read a lot about this. A signal transmitted off of your antenna up at that A, that's the direct ray that you always care about. But you need to care about the second ray. Well, I only have two of them up. Yes, you do. There's an image reflected from the ground. And if you can get these two to match and be together, whoa, because the reflected ray travels further by the distance. And that is considered as the reflected image. But if you can get those two together simply by raising the antenna, quarter wave, half wave, whatever, oh my goodness. And, and it's interesting to me that I never read this. By golly, you read it in my handbook. I, a lot of this is coming from my handbook. If you don't have my handbook, this is all well documented. But I got things, there's funny little things that I've done over the years. I never use pulleys. Why? Because I don't care what it is. In the wintertime, snow gets on the ice up. No, no, no. You use carabiners, stainless steel locking carabiners. And man, that is the, that's to catch meow. You'll never have a problem with them. It's, and then when you build your center insulators, you can make it out of fiberglass or plexiglass that one on the top, right? Just drill yourself a few holes and weave it, weave the feed line through there. It works great. Or if you really want to get in, into it, you can take a block and of uh, plexiglass and make something like that. I love doing dipoles that are fan dipoles. That works well. You can make a, a center insulator with uh, uh, eight holes and away you go. That works great. And uh, I've used these things for years, but my all-time favorite is the coaxial dipole. But you have to be careful. It's coming to sell the bazooka. No, 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 no. You want an bona fide, honest to goodness, MIT version. They designed this in 1938 for the armed services as a radar wide range antenna. You could find these things on, you put them on 75 meters and you're going to cover pretty much of the phone band, absolutely flat. 
uh, all the way. 40 meters is ridiculously flat. And uh, look up the MIT. It's in my book. That's it, it, the best way to do it. it. It builds your own. You can build it a couple of different ways. I like to build it uh, the whole thing out of RG58U. It has to have a velocity factor of 0.66. That's very important. You can't just go get a bunch of coax and do this. Otherwise, the dimensions are wrong, but it's all in my book. I did a lot of slopers. These work really good. Use the leg of the tower as the shield of the second. See, an antenna has, there's two antennas. And uh, you have to do something with that shield. You can't just let it hang. And so I do some of that. And uh, a, a true sloper really works nice. This works great. But uh, these are all things that you need to think about. When I came here to Belleville, uh, I, this is a very small lot. What am I going to do? Uh, I only have about a, oh, maybe 90 foot. But there's a lady across the street from me. She has a 70 foot tree and I have a 70 foot tree in the back. And so her husband, who is deceased, sad, but he was a ham. So she kind of understands. So I borrowed her, I borrowed her tree. <laughs> uh, one of my friends has a big uh, air cannon and we shot over her 70 foot and mine. So we have this, the, the antenna running across the street, but you'll never see it. Why? This is a really cool thing. Pay attention. MFJ has the coolest antenna lead it's very strong. It's seven strands. And uh, you could tow your car with this stuff. It's really strong. But when you, when you get it all out and make the antenna, you can't see it. I, I still, every day I do when I go out to get in the car, I can't hardly see it. And so uh, why not? You know, it's, it's really great. You can do a roof mount tower. So even if you think you have, uh, uh, don't have a place for an antenna, yes, you do. Yeah, try anything, anything. The government even has a book on how to tune a tree. <laughs> I know you're thinking, Heil, you are not. No, this is a page out of the <laughs> armed services book. If you're out in the middle of nowhere, what are you going to do? You can't get up an antenna and you'd be surprised you can get a signal out of a tree. And then what do you do about attics? Well, my friend Jim, he was something. AC0KN, he built this amazing antenna, covers two meters to 80 meters in the attic. And look what it is doing. He's worked, he worked a hundred countries with this thing. All the bands are covered. You see it here. Each one of the different links, of course, they're cut the link. But it's just very cool for people that have never tried attic antennas. It works great. And then you have a doom and gloomer. Oh, Heil, that's not going to work. Yeah, well, does this, does this mean anything to you? Look at it on 40 meters. He also wanted six meter yet. Yeah, there's an FM repeater. Look at that. The son of a gun's flat. So you see, anything can work. Anything. Uh, the slinkies work. You ever try a slinky? Oh, man, those things are great. And so, you know, this is for the guy that says, well, I got to have my RCWR this flat. I live for 40 years without an SWR meter. I don't care. If the transmitter will tune, let her go. But some of these solid state things today will shut down. But man, uh, don't be disgruntled. I hear guys, oh my God, oh my God, my SWR is 1.7. Oh my God, I got to get off the air. What is wrong with you? <laughs> and you get into balance, not a balum. I just want to come up out of my seat when I hear people calling them balums. It's a balanced to unbalanced. That's where the word comes from. A balanced signal to an unbalanced signal. And there's how we do it. 
a ballon and just all kinds of other things, crazy stuff. You, you, you use uh, toilet flanges to uh, uh, bring coax up into your room. This was before you put the tile down. Man, that really works great. But nobody, I guess, thinks about it. And then you talk about your connectors. I learned from my KMOX engineer, wonderful mentor engineer. Whoa. All of his coax connectors were done like that. And so I started doing them like that 60 some years ago. But people would make fun of me because I'm going to ask you a question. When you do it where you have to solder through the little holes, can you be 100% sure to me that 100% of them are soldered? No, you can't. Well, I'll tell you what, I can. I felt really bad over the years. I wouldn't show many people how I did it. Even the RG58s, that's what you do with the adapters. We get it all done, seal it up with tape, and away you go. About five years ago, I visited K3LR, multi-million dollar contest station. I look over in the corner and here, I, there must be at least, at least a hundred leads coming into this thing. And every single solitary one of them is soldered like this. And it was my reprieve because I said, Tim, do you do that? I mean, is it? Well, yeah, that's how I know 100% of its shield is soldered. So from that day forward, mm -hmm, you don't have to take a back seat about that. We'll talk to Tim about it. I showed you this earlier. That really works slick. There it is after the tile I got in. But anyway, we're going to wind things up, but I will have to tell you, don't do this. Somebody sent me this. <laughs> I hope this was a Photoshop picture. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's, it, 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 come on. <laughs> and a lot of people ask me about microphone patch, pan, you know, switch box. I don't want to use my, one microphone everywhere. Well, you're leading yourself to disaster. Ground loops, RFI, oh, it's amazing. But yeah, I, I've, I've tried my all my life to do it. I never did it right. Well, I did 15 years ago, I figured it out. And what I did is I went back to the old telephone operator, that kind of a deal. And I built a switch panel and there's all of the different transmitters coming up. Those are all my AM transmitters, one microphone. And I just take that yellow lead and plug it into each one of those. They're all nylon jacks. There is no ground between them. That's where you get into trouble with the switch boxes. And the bottom one is the push to talk line. There are no grounds that are shared with any of this. They're nylon jacks. Everything goes right to the input of the transmitter, just as if you'd plug your microphone in there. That's where they get in trouble. And uh, I've done several versions of it. Here's the one that you see behind me for the uh, uh, eight pin uh, that we're using today. But again, Nothing is grounded. The only ground is done at the connector and the radio as it should be. So those are just little tips that I've been through my whole life. I hope a lot of you got to cover uh, the pine board project. We, we might want to come down here some, some night, Paul, and, and do a whole deal on the pine board and some building. There have been some wonderful things. There's a guy to build one in a cigar box, a guy to build one in a, a, a guitar amp chassis and just stuff like that. The guy took his kid's lunch box. And th there's so much fun in building this. And, and I use every day. I'm on the air on AM. There's a lot of AM activity, especially in Indiana. You want to pay attention to this. Even if you don't operate AM, you want to respect what we call the AM window from 3870 to 3890. You see, AM stations are mostly crystal controlled. They can't move around. You can. 
with your sideband transmitters and you don't want to pile into the middle of the AM guys. And a lot of times you might not hear them. Hey, well, there's nobody here. Well, there might be. And so you want to do that. 7290 to 7295, so on and so on. And uh, it, 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 it just, just wonderful stuff. That's uh, my ICO that I, uh, I use. I really love that. Well, we're going to close down here, but I want to do one thing. One of my favorite things that I'm doing is bringing you our parametric receive audio system. There are a few of these things out and I thought, what is going on? They, they don't work and they're, they're, it had to be right. So I go back to my teaching of Paul Klipsch, the king of audio. He taught me how to take a speaker, take it out into free air and do a cone resonance, figure out what the resonance of that paper cone is. Then you build the box to that frequency so there's no phase distortion. The speaker does not move, doesn't have to. It's very efficient. The amplifier happens to be a, a 25 watts. And 25 watts is way more than you need, but the headroom is there. There is no distortion because it is 0.1%. That's just hi-fi levels. 0.1% at 25 watts. The speaker has a three and a half inch tweeter. And uh, it, it this the speaker box alone is a miracle. I've had a lot of guys that are just buying that speaker. They can plug a microphone into the back of it. They're using it for small PA systems or just to amplify anything without distortion. But we have something for ham radio that is unbelievable. As I said, there's several things out there, but I'm sorry, they're, they're not of this quality, quality. And I'm really, really proud of that because no one seems to care a lot of stuff tomorrow, today. That's what bugs me. We, uh, we do care and we care a lot about everybody. This is what happened with the parametric receive system. First of all, it has two amplifiers. These are separate amps. These are not wide together. They're separate amps for the left side and the right side of your headset or in a logger and an operator. But if you wanted to split your, your headphones up, you can have different levels. And this is helping a lot of people that have hearing impairments of balance. This is another amp, but it's an output. It's not wide off of anything. And you can plug that into your computer and make some really nice recordings as I did that you're going to hear now. Three different EQ systems. This is sitting at 6k plus or minus. This is 160 hertz plus or minus. But this is the parametric this is the gain of that amplifier, just leave it there. But it's variable from 400 to 4,000. And you'll be able to hear immediately what an incredible thing about ha happens when we get signals that are in the noise and hard to understand and I preached, preached it all night, how important 2.5K is now. Here's when the rubber hits the road. Let me get rid of that. Here we go. This is the way you hear it. Flat. 2.5. Here's the way you hear it. It is flat. India, Alpha Mike, over. Hello, teachers, 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 it's flat. Teachers, 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 teachers. Echo, India is Bravo, Alima, Bravo. E-I-A-T-L-D, calling And there's no way you can argue with this. This is, a, this is a project that we've spent years on. I've had a lot of my engineer friends look at it, listen to it. And every one of them, hmm, wow. 
it's something that you you really need to take a good look at and we're, we're excited to bring that to ham radio but all of this is uh in my handbook i hope that uh, you get a chance to uh to go through that it's uh, almost all the dealers have it or you can order it on our web store or call fairview heights and we'll We'll do that. Most of them today, I'm signing for everybody. I'd be glad to do that for you. This book I wrote is on our website and it's free. You can download it, but boy, does it have some information. Wow. It all starts with the microphone. A lot of things we talked about tonight. I'm very honored that some time back we were uh, commissioned to uh, have a display in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We're the only manufacturer in the Rock Hall. And that mixer you see behind me, that was a, a mixer, it was a quadraphonic mixer we built for Pete Townsend for to do quadraphenia. Those are some of our power amps and EQs and things. The back of that has a mixer we built for ZZ Top. We were the first people to do monitors because of phasing. And the first talk box, you can't see it, real well, but is there signed by Peter and by Joe. I also was honored with an honorary PhD of degree from Mizzou in music and technology. All of this stuff just, I, I think about it sometime, how it all happened to a little kid from Marissa, but it was all about ham radio. It's why I take time to do this. And I know it take, it's, it's been a long time, but think about all the things that we talked about. And you haven't probably heard maybe none of them. And that really irritates me because we, we all need it. Me too. I learn things every day. I'm not kidding you. But I'm constantly reading some of these papers and things that, that are brought to us that the only way you're going to get it is by listening to some of the, the really schooled engineers. But... Uh, Let's see if you have any questions. I, I do hope you have some questions tonight. No questions dumb the first time, Paul. <laughs> yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and unmute and ask. Hey, Bob, what's that VU meter you got in the back underneath your red car? That is a Duro, D-O-R-R-O-U-G-H, a Duro loudness meter. Practically every radio station in the world uses Mike DeRoe's meter. It's very calibrated. I use it actually to calibrate microphone levels. If we're having a situation with an element, we're not sure. I can put that through a, uh, here I just got it tied into the output of this little mixer, but we put it into the uh, the real world and uh, we can really measure things down to the one degree and uh, of course one db yeah, thank so you very you, much sure. great show tonight bob fantastic as usual well hope you learned something oh yes okay anybody else yes i have one. i only wish i no. only wish bob that um you had gotten involved with the uh, fire alarm business too because the audio on the uh, audible fire alarm systems is horrible. Yeah. I, there's a lot of things. I get this uh, almost daily <laughs> of something like hearing aids. Oh my goodness. I, I, I don't understand those people. Uh, I, I think it would be easy to fix, but they, uh, they don't seem to, don't seem to care. I think it's the whole deal. And that's kind of sad, really sad. All right. I heard uh, another one in there. Yeah, Kent here, AEE. -E. Go ahead, Kent. Uh, yeah, Bob, this is a non, uh, well, <laughs> this is one you may not answer, but uh, what's up with purple? That's an interesting thing, but nobody seems to know, and they should. It was it all started years ago, and I'm waiting for somebody. God, 35 people work for me. They all know, but. Nobody seems to care or come forth with it. And I'm just waiting because if somebody ever really knows why, well, maybe I'll give them a microphone or two. Or I, I know why. Yeah. But that's, <laughs> that's cheating. <laughs> yeah. Cause you work for us. There you go. 
I think I well, give you. I'll, I'll talk to Paul and I'll find out. There you go. I hope. <laughs> Privately, I promise not to tell. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. His uh, his office at the old plant in Morris, Illinois. The wallpaper was purple. <laughs> yeah, but why was it purple? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. No, there, there's, yeah. there's reasons. <laughs> okay. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you again very much, Bob. It's been a very pleasant uh, evening, and uh, and we'll put this up on uh, on YouTube for those members who couldn't be here tonight. Several of them emailed me, and uh, yeah. yeah, we'll do this again sometime. Like you said, talk about the Pine Board Project and building some things. Well, what I'm doing now, I'm going back to the uh, uh, you know, to the clubs that I've done things with, and we. Uh, we pick out a subject and, and do it. And it, it really, really does work because we can talk about a lot of different things. I'll tell you. Yeah. That it just, to me, it, uh, these are things that I don't read in the magazines and I, I think they should be because uh, as you saw tonight, there's a lot of these things that mean something to your signal and uh, how are you going to learn it? So we'll come back and uh, hopefully not bore you more, but bring you some more information. And uh, I really appreciate the time, to, Paul. I'm glad that we could be here. Yeah, I'd love the <laughs> photo. Oh, <laughs> oh, God, that was a young me. Yeah, it was. Absolutely. I found a couple <laughs> old copies of harmonics when I was cleaning out a box, too. So. <laughs> oh, boy. We had fun, but we all learned, didn't we? Me, yeah. too. Yeah, and I, I still have my my CB in a box somewhere from that project. So well, ten meters is coming around, so let's get them out. <laughs> yeah. I also still have, if you remember, uh, when it was Sears. Did Sears have the uh, relabeled FRG sevens, or was that pennies? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sears had them, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've still got I still got the one that Dad had gotten. I got it when he yeah. passed away. Yeah, yeah, right. They. Uh, uh, that they came to me on that project too, because they were going to have to throw them away. So then they could give them to the club and we were, uh, we were licensed and all that. So they could write it off. Yeah. But it sure did cause a buzz in the 10 meter FM world. Yep. All right. Okay. Thank Thanks you very everybody. much. Yep. Well, Thanks, Bob. Bob. Catch you on the air somewhere. Yep. Okay. Bye bye for now. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, I will let uh, everyone know about uh, our next presentation. Uh, when I get that lined up, I've got a number of people I've been talking to and we'll keep doing these until we uh, until we have a place. Um, Matt, I saw that. Thanks. We'll see if anything comes of that. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be, we'll be wait, I hear somebody.